Mark Rogers TV back with you as we continue to preview just about every football team we can possibly get to before 2015 hits us in just about two weeks. We stop in uh, Lawrence, Kansas to talk the Jayhawks with David Potter of Rock Chalk Talk. Hey, David, thanks so much for joining us for the first time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So a lot of new players, a lot of new coaches on the coaching staff and the head man himself, David Beatty, coming in from Texas A&M. He's got a long stay under his belt at Kansas going to be running an air raid offense with new offensive coordinator as well. So you got the senior Michael Cummings com coming off a knee injury uh, back in the spring, started the final seven games, was pretty consistent. Uh, and he's got a dual threat quarterback in Montel Kozar to compete with a couple true freshmen. So we're a couple weeks into camp. Uh, how would you uh, spin the quarterback battle at this point? Well, Cummings, in all likelihood, is going to miss the season from what, what I can tell. Uh, he's definitely not going to be ready to start the year. Um, there's a possibility he might be ready to go later on, but whether he applies for a medical red shirt or, or tries to get back on the field will probably depend on how things are going at that point. So Montel Cozart is really expected to be the guy at this point. Um, there are a couple of true freshmen, Ryan Willis, and uh, Carter Stanley, who are uh, competing, I think, for that backup spot. But right now, it's definitely Montel Cozart's job to lose. Okay, so Cozart's the guy, dual threat option right there at quarterback for the Jayhawks. We look at running back, and despite losing your leading rusher, dismissed from the team, uh, Corey Avery, it, it seems to be a pretty deep position. You have a number of guys you can go to there. Yeah, the uh, most exciting guy is uh, one we haven't seen yet. He was a uh, JUCO uh, player of offensive player of the year last year. His name's Keon Kinner. Kinner. Uh, he actually uh, had committed to Texas coming out of high school, but there were some academic issues with the JUCO route. And uh, by all accounts, he's really uh, impressing people in practice. So uh, I, I think re running back should be okay uh we've got a actually a sixth year senior taylor cox back from uh, a second straight uh season ending injury hopefully he'll be able to contribute and then deandre mann who played and i believe the first nine games of the year last year before getting hurt uh returns as well so there will be a few different running backs who are able to contribute so, David, a wide receiver, you return all of seven catches. So, basically, no experience there. Who are you looking to step up uh, this fall? I mean, that that's arguably the biggest question mark on the team. Uh, Joshua Stanford was a surprise graduate transfer coming over from Virginia Tech. Um, as a freshman at, at Tech, he set some freshman receiving records. So, um, he knows he knows what he's doing. He's basically guaranteed a starting job with the lack of depth we have that we're at receiver. Um, but uh, outside of him, it's going to be a lot of freshmen and, and unknowns competing for snaps. Uh, uh, the offensive coordinator, Rob Likens, has said he wants to use as many as seven, eight receivers per game and keep rotating them in and out. But uh, there just aren't any proven commodities out there. There's a red shirt freshman, Tyler Patrick, who had a, a nice spring game, seemed to be a favorite target of the, the quarterbacks in the spring game, at least. Um, but, uh, you know, like you said, we were turning seventh catches at that position. So uh, snaps outside of uh, Joshua Stanford are pretty, pretty much going to be up for grabs. David, as you well know, 118th in scoring offense in the country last year. Uh, we can talk all sorts of position players, skill position players, but if the offensive line doesn't make it happen and create space, uh, it, it's not going to happen. So any hope there of improving along the offensive front? I mean, it's mostly going to be the same players. We did just lose uh, uh, a guy who started some games as a true freshman, Junior Vicinia, just quit the team a couple of weeks ago. So that was uh, an unfortunate surprise. Um, but really, the the hope there comes down to the new coaching staff and, and seeing what they can do with these guys. Because most of them were the same guys who were there last year and, and really, really struggled and were probably the biggest reason for the offensive uh, issues that Kansas had. Um, so, you know, everyone's really hoping that the, the new scheme, the new coaching staff can come in and get more out of these guys than, uh, than the previous staff could. You know, they're also all a year older, so hopefully that in and of itself will improve their play somewhat. David Potter joining us from Rock Chalk Talk on the SB Nation platform for KU Athletics, 106th 
scoring defense. Two guys back on the defensive side, so nine new guys, at least in terms of the formal uh, depth chart. Defensive line seems to be a pretty good uh, position for you on the defensive side. Ben Goodman's a pretty good player, so set us up there. Yeah, the line is probably as close as we have to a, a solid unit on the team. Like you mentioned, Ben Goodman uh, had a pretty good sophomore year two years ago. Last year was moved to more of an interior role, but this year they're going back to a four-man front, so he's going to be able to to blitz off the edge, which is really what he's best at. Um, we've got uh, some returning players in Kapil Fletcher and uh, TJ Semke, uh, who got some time at defensive tackle last year. Um, there's also a, a, a new transfer who showed up that uh, no one was really expecting. His name's Corey King from Miami. Uh, didn't play much in Miami. He's had a lot of injury issues, but he figures to uh, to be a factor in the rotation there. So up front, you know, if, if there is a, a proven uh, unit on the team, the defensive line is probably about as close as it comes. Yeah, you've gotten hit with a number of losses, even aside from injury. So we talk about Avery, dismissed from the team, your top returning running back. Uh, you mentioned the offensive lineman, one of your best, uh, decide decided to walk away from football, as well as uh, Jake Lovett, linebacker, one of the more consistent uh, backers you had. So can you set us up for the back seven? Yeah, Jake Love uh, retiring from football was a bit of a surprise to everyone. He was a, a very solid player, um, probably not next level talent, but uh, just a high football IQ kind of guy. Uh, it looks like he's going to be replaced by a, a graduate transfer from South Carolina. His name's Marquise Roberts. Uh, actually started some games at South Carolina, but uh, another guy who his career there was kind of derailed by injuries, but he figures to immediately step in at uh, one of the two linebacker spots and, uh, and, and will probably be the best player at the position. Um, it looks like the other starter is probably going to be Courtney Arnick, who started out uh, his career as a nickelback at Kansas. Kansas has uh, has bulked up a bit, uh, played some at linebacker last year, and actually did a pretty decent job. So there's not a whole lot of depth behind those two. There's a, uh, a sophomore, Kyron Watson, who was pretty highly regarded coming out of high school, but he played behind Ben Heaney last year. We never really got to see much out of him. So It'll be interesting to see if he can live up to his billing out of high school. Um, there's not a lot of depth there, but uh, th there are a couple of, uh, of decent players. David, it's not necessarily a schedule that's going to wow people, but if you compare it against what most schools schedule in the Power Five against other Power Five, it's actually not bad in regards to Memphis being a pretty good football team. Uh, they're back in the mix under uh, uh, Coach Fuentway. And then you've got uh, Rutgers, who was back in the bowl mix, winning a bowl game against uh, North Carolina last year. So it's a fairly tough non-conference slate. I think Baylor could could take some uh, <laughs> some tips from Kansas scheduling here when it comes to football because it's, it's Memphis, it's Rutgers after the opener against South Dakota State. What I like about Big 12 scheduling, and you kind of fell into this situation, obviously, with the two schools leaving the conference well more than that and then other other schools coming in and you finish with 10 is the true championship format i like that everybody plays everybody i love conference championship games but aside from that that it's a true championship i believe in that so in in looking at the schedule and knowing what you know about the personnel it, your thoughts about what could be the the best uh, case scenario here as far as getting through the conference schedule um I mean, if Kansas is going to win any games, uh, it, it's going to have to be an upset. Uh, from from what I've seen, it sounds like uh, their opener against South Dakota State is probably going to be the only game where they're favored this year. Um, you know, they they're coming off a three and nine season where they lost the vast majority of their starters. Uh, so, um, it, it, if I'm being realistic, it, it, it's it's entirely possible that they're going to go through the conference season without winning a game. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's just the reality of, of trying to turn a program around in a conference as competitive as the big 12 is. Hey, David, uh, one of the reasons I love having you guys on is uh, the personal breakdown. So I try to follow everybody a little bit and try to have some insight into personnel. And then also the, the, um, the pulse that you are able to take of the fan base, 
uh, and, and the community there in Kansas. So we, we know what the story has been since Todd Reesing and that gang uh, departed and you were very competitive for a few years in that one enormous season that you had in winning the Orange Bowl. So do you go into this season with any kind of optimism? What's the temperature there? I mean, right now it's about as close to starting from scratch as you can get without actually starting, literally starting a new football program. Uh, Charlie Weiss went really heavy on the JUCOs and a lot of them didn't pan out. And now we're in a position where out of 85 possible scholarship players, I believe we've got 64 on the roster right now. It's just a, it's a depleted roster. It's a young roster. Um, so honestly, the expectations just aren't very high for this year. I think people are looking more to to see who can develop and become the guys for the future, and uh, you know to to see how the new offense looks, um, and just see if if David Beatty can get things at least moving in the right direction and show some kind of improvement. I don't think anyone's really gonna planning on looking at the the wins and losses at the end of the year to, to measure how this team goes. It's just not, uh, it's just not where the team's at right now. It's, it's, uh, it's year one of what's probably going to be uh, a rebuilding process that takes a couple of seasons. Hey David, before I let you go, I'm going to take you down a different path. And I mentioned the 2007 team. I, I know a Kansas fan who, and we did a little, uh, little research on the internet. And, and so it's just amazing that this, that this program that's basically devoid of any postseason success just splashes onto the scene. We looked up some NFL rosters and it's incredible that they're like, I might be off by one or two, like 14 NFL players uh, from Kansas currently in the NFL. And like all of them, except for one played on that orange bowl team played during that time. What in the world happened to Kansas football that lightning struck for, for that uh, one or two seasons? For a few years there, especially right before uh, that 2007 season that uh, resulted in the Orange Bowl victory, Mark Mangino had put together a really good staff. Mangino himself is not necessarily known as a great recruiter, um, but he had, through the years, he had some guys like Dave Doran, who's now head coach at NC State, Jerry Kill, who's up in Minnesota, um, David Baby was on the staff at one point. Ed Warner, who's a co-offensive coordinator for Ohio State, those guys were all on on the staff at one time for another for him, and and they they came up with some really good recruiting classes for a couple of years, and they were able to just find a, a really good mix of of players who, uh, you, ranging from guys who maybe weren't as le- athletic but had great football IQ. Um, to guys who are, are still around in the NFL today. It was really just kind of a perfect storm situation, and those, those assistants moved on to, to bigger and better jobs and weren't necessarily replaced with, uh, I, I think, the same caliber of coach. And then you know things started to, to fade away, and then there was the scandal in 2009 with the, the player abuse, and you know it's just all been downhill since then. Okay, when you rip off those coaching names, that explains a lot. So thanks for uh, going back in history and filling us in there. Uh, David Potter from uh, Rock Chalk Talk on the uh, SP Nation platform for Kansas Athletics. Hey, David, thanks so much for the information and the insight. Yeah, thanks for having me.